In this lecture, we'll be looking at the British tradition of landscape recording, abstraction and reflexivity in mapping, and review ways that people have attempted to decolonize mapping. We'll start with a discussion of the Bowden and McComish article you were asked to read this week. So Bowden and McComish describe the unique approach that British archaeologists have in examining the landscape. As they state, this includes a close observation of the ground surface, direct measurement of all significant features, detailed analysis and inter interpretation of the relationship between features, production of a plan, and written account that illustrates this interpretation. That doesn't sound extremely different from other models, but they argue that it is a very unique approach. In archaeology, you must become conversant with this mode of understanding the landscape and the ways that British archaeologists represent this landscape. But you should also understand, as shown in the previous lecture, that there are many other ways of representing this landscape, and this mode may not reflect what prehistoric people thought about the landscape or how this information should be presented to a wider public. Also note that the supplemental readings for this week include manuals on landscape mapping in archaeology that are really useful. Note that Bowden and McComish describe the British approach as inherently subjective and contrast this with other objective approaches. For example, some other methods show earthworks as contours, whereas the British survey plan may include contours but also hachures to depict slopes and to show the relative chronological relationships between different site components. So for this example, bank A. A has no discernible relationship with B. That means you can't tell if B cuts or lies or underlies earthwork A, so we assume it is contemporary. A is overlain by and therefore earlier than C, overlies and is therefore later than D, has been cut by a later breach at F, and the scarp at G fades into the natural topography. In theory, you should be able to read all of these things just by examining the hashiers and the relationships between the hashiers on this plan. Another example, on the left is a hashiered plan of a building in the bailey of Chipping Norton Castle. The hashiered plan brings out more detail and renders the structure comprehensible. The underlying ground surface is relatively level. On the right is a contour plan, which gives a general impression of the most substantial part of the earthwork, but does not show the extent of which. As Bowden and McComish note, both were surveyed with a survey-grade GPS, but the contour plan took much longer to generate and is a much more laborious process, unless, of course, the measurements are provided remotely by laser scanning or by LIDAR. The British tradition is so strong that Bowden and McComish suggest that earthworks exist in other countries, but go undetected because of the differing perception of space and how to interpret landscapes. They credit the history of the Ordnance Survey as being instrumental in identifying antiquities as features of the landscape, effectively training generations of British people to locate these earthworks. As Bowden and McComish argue, the British tradition isn't necessarily superior, though I'm wondering about how much of this is just kind of being a little bit humble for appearances, but there are certain advantages. They posit that the subjective approach improves interpretation, and I'd say encourages a more active interaction with the landscape. Landscape interpretation, they say, is a skill, and I'd agree. They also determine that it could be useful elsewhere. At the site of Fuwera in Qatar, I did both a British-style interpretive recording exercise, but also a topo map. The topo map had more in common with what Ingold would term transit. We had to get a height every five meters in a grid, which did not encourage more active interaction with space. Whereas an interpretive map had us looking hard at the desert landscape, trying to see walls, rooms, and doors, and as you can see by the image, it was actually quite difficult, and you really had to work to get your eye in to understand the and interpret the site. But, as Matthew Johnson states, it's difficult to communicate to a non-British observer how deeply a familiarity with the Ordnance Survey map is embedded in the consciousness of the British landscape archaeologist, and of anyone, professional or amateur, walking across the landscape as a whole. The British students in this course are, for the most part, pre-programmed to read and examine Ordnance Survey maps. This is likely to aid them in becoming an archaeologist, 
But it is also good to understand that there are different ways to depict space. Which brings us to abstraction and reflexivity in mapping. Within archaeology and geography, some scholars critically examine map making in GIS, including Tomaskova, who states, to recognize the translations and mediation embedded in context or the position of a subject within any given process of representation is to call for more explicit acknowledgement of the historical situatedness of our current mapping practices. Bowden and McComish acknowledge the context of the British tradition of landscape survey and mapping, but do not necessarily suggest any ways to improve or to change the genre. In another selection from the reading this week, Valdez Tulet encourages us to think deeply about the maps that we produce. He notes the obsession with accuracy, but also that the maps are subjective and open to debate. One person's large post hole is another person's small pit. He notes that Better maps could be made if we paid attention to the audience and selected information that was relevant to them, that they could immediately identify and was meaningful in their daily life. As he also notes, maps bring space into being, so we must be careful with our creations and interpretations. Again, going back to Ingold, wayfaring with the example of the Inuit moving through the world along paths of travel, versus transport, such as the British sailing across the surface of the globe, and is destination-oriented. Valdez Toulet draws from Henri Lefebvre in noting representations of space, so space is designed, codified, created by maps, plans, signs, and GIS, the official way that we are supposed to navigate our landscapes. Representational space is a reaction to this structure, it's resistance, reappropriation, such as graffiti, a hole in the fence, desire paths, and emphasizes the users of the space. Note in these two examples, the image on the left comes up a lot when people talk about user experience design. So representations of space would be the paving, whereas representational space is the dirt path that people actually walk on. The example on the right is how a representational space could be made into a representation of space. To note, the University of California, Berkeley followed the approach of waiting to see where students walk and then paved the resulting paths, showing responsiveness to user experience. In reflexive map making, we address what are we recording and why? If we are recording for ourselves, we build a model that will allow us to visit that place repeatedly, though separated from it by thousands of miles. Similarly, we design for other archaeologists to convey information about the site. It gets a bit different when we design for an interested public to help them understand how to see archaeological remains, and finally to explore how the site might have been used or seen in the past. Valdez Tullet uses the example of this John Speed map of Leicester, wherein you can identify the buildings, walls, trees, and the river that winds through Leicester. This is in contrast to a current map, which has some representation of green space, but focuses on the transport around and through the town. Finally, we will look at decolonizing mapping. We return once again to Matthew Johnson, who previously reminded us of the ubiquity of the Orden survey map to state, it is very difficult for a student of the English landscape to look at the much-loved symbols, contour lines, and folds of the Orden survey map and see them as simply or solely as elements of a colonialist enterprise. This is another digimap produced of the immediate surrounds of Benenborough Hall. In it, you see the property lines inscribed in the landscape. This might be relatively uncontroversial to those who haven't studied British history in terms of enclosure, but might become even more problematic when imposed onto, say, Ireland, where the work of the Orden Survey led to an attempted erasure of much of the native understanding of the landscape. Matthew Johnson notes that the topographer and mapmaker Bartlett published his general description of Ireland in 1603 after the attempted plantation of Munster and before that of Ulster. The reaction of the native Irish was to 
ambush and behead Bartlett. They recognize the colonizing force of the map. Matthew Johnson also notes that historical geographers have argued that the 18th and 19th century development of ordnance survey maps was bound up with the need of the ruling classes to control and dominate the landscape. This need was originally a specifically military one. English armies needed a reliable guide to help them patrol the Scottish Highlands after the 1745 rebellion. So various organizations and individuals have tried strategies to intervene in colonial map making. One intervention is to use existing maps to show indigenous territories. This, for an example, is a map of what is now California, showing the complex and overlapping territories of indigenous people who still exist, in case you were wondering. This is the landmark map of indigenous and community lands, which is similar but has more information on agricultural lands in Europe. It doesn't catch all of the common lands within the UK, though. Here, for example, are the common lands around York, and it seems to not include several, like Hob Moor. So I encourage you to go through some of the links introduced in this class and check them out for yourself. There are several examples of these and more on the Decolonial Atlas. This one demonstrates the land that was actually discovered by Europeans, that is, was uninhabited before their arrival. And the Decolonial Atlas includes many other examples, including this one of a 1968 Toreg sand map of grazing grounds, as usually inscribed in the sand and recorded by Toreg informants on paper later. You will, of course, remember the several examples given by Ingold of similar mapping strategies. The Atlas gives fantastic detail to this map and the Toreg experience of space as such. The map's linear form reflects the pattern of relict river valleys along which Torig herds graze during the dry season. The small numbered circles mark the position of wells along the valley floor. The map's focus on hydrographic networks reflects transhumance routes. So orientation of this map is determined in relation to Mecca, which devout Muslim Torig face five times a day while praying. The other directions are defined by what is in front of, behind, left or right of the person praying. This is shown elsewhere in the Central African rainforest region of Kasai, where individuals commonly orient themselves in relation to the flow of rivers. Finally, one more example from North America combines these strategies, that of using familiar maps but also in a uniquely indigenous orientation. The Lakota orient south at the top. This map shows the Lakota territory as defined by the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie between the U.S. government and the Lakota, as you see in the light blue center. Finally, decolonizing mapping is an ongoing project, but one that is worthwhile to think about. As I've shown, you can inscribe existing maps, study indigenous map making, and combine current technology and indigenous map making. This latter is a form of critical GIS, which has other components such as feminist GIS, and can be seen as a larger activist movement in geography that we won't be covering further in this module.